Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm Season 2 podcast. My name is Yvonne Hartley from the Jeremy Bamber Innocence Campaign, and I am joined today by my colleague, Philip Walker. Today, we are delighted to be joined by a multi-talented author, actor, podcaster, and true crime enthusiast, Steve Wraith, who is going to talk to us about his many different aspects of his career, including his interest in true crime and why he supports Jeremy. So I'll hand over to Philip for the first question. So, Steve, what, when did your acting career begin and, uh, and what first attracted you to, to acting? I was a child actor, to be honest. Um, I was seven year old when I, I first played King Canute in the school play. And um, I really enjoyed it. My parents were allowed to come and watch it. Uh, and they they saw something in me. They, they saw it bring out a, a confidence in me and they could see that I could perform. So when I got to 11, um, they enrolled me in a, a, a Saturday theatre club, which was at um, the, the People's Theatre in Jesmond. Um, and there was me, uh, Neil Tennant from the Pet Shop Boys, uh, Tom Goodman Hill, who's gone on to, to perform on, on stage, but also in some you know, well, well-renowned movies along, alongside the likes of Sean Connery. And, and we used to go to a Saturday morning club, 11 o'clock, uh, 11 o'clock uh, through to one. Um, and it was just fun and games, trust exercises. And then, you know, we would, we would audition for parts. We would, we would, you know, play different characters in plays and, and perform them at the theater. So I did that from 11 until I was 18 and, and you know, my life was mapped out. I thought I was going to be an actor, but I, I when I left school, um, I, I ended up going to a college. I did a, a BTEC diploma in drama and it wasn't what it was cracked up to be. And I, I ended up, um, doing a pantomime for a local company and I got ripped off. I got promised an equity card. I was promised a lot of money for, for performing in this pantomime. It was a touring pantomime and um, it was tiring. It was long days. I was doing three shows a day. I was putting the show, putting the set up, um, performing a two hour play, taking the set down and going on to the next venue. It was, it was slave labor and it's it, put, it put me off acting. It put me off acting. So at the age of 18, me, me life really, and my life ambition was in tatters. And that was how I got into acting, but I, I walked away from it at 18. Um, and ultimately I didn't go back to it until I was 30. And that was really through a chance meeting with a couple of mates of mine who had asked me for some advice. Um, I, by that time, I was I was working as a nightclub doorman in Newcastle. I was a head doorman of a nightclub. And um, I'd met, you know, quite a few people through a lot of connections in London I had who were, you know, stars of the stage and screen. And one of them was a, a guy called John Altman, who was uh, Nick Cotton and EastEnders. And um, he was going to be doing a play called Bouncers uh, by John Godber. And uh, he was going to be performing it in Sunderland, 10 miles down the road. And he asked if he could come and spend a night on the door with me to get into character uh, for this particular production, this, this particular play. And I said, yeah, no problem. So, so he came up, he, um, you know, he, he spent a night on the door with me. And then a couple of months later, he came up and he, he played the, the role and he played it with such a plum that he was actually standing on the front door when people were coming into the theatre and people actually thought he was a doorman, which <laughs> tells you how good a job he did, but how good a job Abby's had did teaching him. But it, it just... It, it was that night. We had a night out afterwards. We had a few few drinks um, after the play. And, you know, they were talking, the, the other actors. And, and basically, John said, well, Steve used to be an actor, you know. And the guys who he was with basically just said, well, why, didn't, why don't you go back into it? You never, it's never too late. And I think it was the, the words, you know, you don't want to regret this in later life that, that really, hit yeah, the, exactly. really, really hit the thing with me. And um, that was the start of the journey again. So... The abbreviated version of it is I went back in uh, education. I went back and did a, a, GS, a GCSE uh, um, one year course at the local college uh, to get myself back into it. I hadn't been on stage for 17, you know, best part of 17 years. And yeah. I, I, I loved it. I, I, I did a nighttime course. I, I got a GCSE, of course, out of it. But I also, you know, regained the competence and I, I played a lead role in a play. And the guy came up to us at the end, who was the head of drama at the college and said, brilliant, Steve, you've still, you've still got it, you know? And this guy, Stephen Melville, used to go to the morning theater club with me back when I was a kid. And he said, you should pursue this. And I said, well, how do I do that? And he says, you need to take the degree. If you, if you want to, you want to progress, if you want to learn more about what it's all about then do the degree. So I did the degree 
Um, Interesting. You know, I did a full time degree and uh, it was a three three year course. Um, I paid for it myself and I, I did learn a lot. And in the meantime, I was doing some extra work. So I, I learned I learned the craft at, at the degree uh, level at college, but I also was doing some extra work to, to get the experience of being on a film set or a TV set. And um, I was an extra for six years. My degree took three years. And, you know, when I turned 40, I, I, I declared myself as a full-time actor. So that was, that was it. A bit of hard work to get to the, to get to the end goal, but, but I got there in the end. And, um, <laughs> you know, it, it was, it was a realization that, you know, the dream that I'd had as a kid, I'd, I'd finally made it a reality. In but you, I, 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 I read you had some interesting experiences acting when you were younger. Didn't you go on a tour of Russia at one point? Yeah, I mean, that was fantastic. I mean, the People's Theatre gave us some fantastic opportunities. I mean, when I was 13, um, I went on a three-week trip of America. So I did uh, New York, Philadelphia, and New Jersey. And um, we were doing Oedipus Rex out there. I was, I, I was on a good little number there because I was only part of the chorus um in that particular place so you know I, I you know although i had a lot of blinds to learn as part of the chorus it was a it was a group a group effort you know tom goodman hill ended up with the lead part in that so he couldn't really have as much time off as we could so we we got to enjoy america i think the only the only regret about that was that um you know I, I don't really have any photographs because back in those days you know, you didn't have phones, you didn't have, um, you didn't have cameras per se. And I had a no, roll on camera, but most of the photographs I've got from there are of buildings or of things, not of us actually in America. So that was the one regret, but it was a fascinating experience. We went to a, we went to a place called Herkimer County. Um, that's where I fell in love for the first time with a young girl who we were house sharing, believe it or not. And um, yeah, we had a little bit of a thing going at 15 years of age. <laughs> Um, and we, we also went to a, a, a summer camp, which was for people, uh, for kids, basically parents would put their kids into a summer camp in America. And it's the first time I'd experienced it. And rather than them being at home for the whole vacation, as they called it, you know, they had summer camps where they had activities, et cetera. So we went and performed at a summer camp, but it was probably the least enjoyable part of the trip because we were staying like at outdoor lodges, which was the first time I'd ever experienced anything like that. And, we're a little bit too close to wildlife for my uh, for my enjoyment. So there was, you know, voles and mice and God knows what running around. And uh, it just, it was too close to nature for me. I, I was used to my home comforts. Um, we went to Philadelphia as well, which was, which was fantastic. And I got a chance to run up the Rocky stairs um, and, and do the whole Adrian thing. The Adrian yeah. thing the, <laughs> but yeah, the Russia trip was a few years later. It was three years later. And um that was just, you know, literally as as the red wall was starting to crumble. So Russia was very much in the start of its change. I mean, you know, we, we went to Moscow and we went to Leningrad, St. Petersburg, and it was it was just fantastic. It was it was it was seeing seeing things that you would never expect to see again. Um, you know, we did see some of the, you know, some of the CDS sides of, of, of that country as well. We saw, you know, people being, you know, arrested and put into cars by plain clothes guys who were clearly the KGB. Um, we saw kids coming up and trying to sell us badges, uh, Russian badges. That was quite a common thing. Um, but they, they looked as if they were destitute and poor. Um you know, we saw both sides of Russia, but it was very few houses and all flats. I think that's what stood out. But I, I played the Artful Dodger out there. I was the um, in, in obviously Oliver Twist. Um, and I, I loved that. It was great. And uh, I got, got a chance to, to play one of those roles that you, you dream of playing. And um, it was fantastic. It was great. The Russians accepted us. They took us. They, you know, they, they took us into their hearts and um, yeah, quite a different, quite a different trip. And although I was only 16, I did manage to sample uh, some Russian vodka uh, when I was out there. <laughs> and um, I, I, I was introduced to brown vodka, actually, which I'd never had before, um, which was fascinating. And uh, not one to drink slowly, shall we say. You had to knock it straight back. But yeah, great trip, great memories. And, um, you know, thankful for the, the people's theatre giving me those opportunities. Fantastic. So when did you first become interested in true crime, Steve? And how did you go from your acting career into podcasting about true crimes? The true crime thing is um, something which started at school. Um, because my mind was set on being an actor, then there was not much attention to detail with exams and studying. Um, I was definitely the class fool. Um, I used to mess around and there was a couple of us who you know, didn't take school too seriously because we felt our lives were mapped out. 
a couple of the guys at school, for instance, had dads who ran companies and businesses and they just felt, well, I'll just fall into that and I don't need to take school too seriously. Whereas I was going to be an actor. In fact, on one particular occasion, um, the headmaster had uh, got to hold me by the scruff of the neck and throw me down on the uh, on the desk in front of the whole class after a, after he discovered that I was copying uh, my homework from the class SWAT and um, basically said, uh, you, you know, what do you want to be when you leave school? And I said, I'm going to be an actor soon. He went, you'll never be an actor. You'll never, ever be an actor. Get that out of your head. And, you know, he was throttling us. And, I, you know, I, obviously I became an actor and I never got the chance to go and see him afterwards. But, um, but yeah, the true, crime, the true crime stuff was basically because I was on course to fail everything at school. And my English teacher uh, didn't, didn't like me at all. Um, but as luck would have it for me, he, he basically never came back after, after going away for an operational procedure. He never returned to the school and he was replaced by a guy called Peter Yates. Um, and Peter came in and clearly saw something in me. And he gave me the opportunity, um, because I was doing the very first year of GCSE exams, to, to add a book that I enjoyed to the coursework. And of course, back in those days, GCSEs was you know, 50% coursework, 50% exams. So he gave me the opportunity to, uh, to study a book that I enjoyed reading. And I just picked up a copy of a book called Profession of Violence by John Pearson um, at uh, the Quayside Market one Sunday morning. And I, I, I kid you not, I read that book from back to front as, as a 15 year old um, in a couple of days. And something about the cover, something about the photographs inside and just something about the story really pulled me in. And it was it was weird because when I look back now, I think, you know, God, how naive was you? You know, how I, how naive were you to be to be sucked in by gangsters? But I was sucked in by the glamour. I was sucked in by that David Bailey photograph on the front with these two sharp suited guys um, inside. If you flick through the photos of that book, you've got Reg with Francis on his arm, a beautiful, you know, beautiful woman. You've got, you know, the, the nightclubs and the bars that they ran and they ran them very successfully and casinos you had the craze photograph with uh, celebrities from the boxing world the acting world and the you know the, the music world um something which you know anybody would love to do you get a chance to meet your heroes and your idols and um you know that it was almost as if my mind had separated the the violence and the murder and put it to that side and just taken all the positives out and yeah. that book was that book was ultimately the book that i was allowed to study for my english exam so i passed with flying colors um, I, you know, I, I ended up with a B and a C in English language and English literature when I was on course to fail both of them. And, um, you know, I passed geography as well. I, I always say I must have only passed geography because I could find my way to school. But you know, <laughs> I still to this day don't know how I passed it, but I did. Um, but yeah, that, that was how I got into true crime. And I, I wrote to the craze um, when I left school. I was 16 years of age and I wrote to Reggie Cray and then I wrote to Ronnie Cray and just said, I just want to say that I've read your book about your lives. And although I know you did wrong and, you know, you're serving your sentence for that, ultimately, um, you know, I wanted to tell you that something good came out of your life in the sense that I read the book about your life and I passed my English exam and I wasn't going to pass any exams. And it was as simple as that. Uh, there was no premeditation. There was no ideas to, you know, to suddenly be friends with these people. It was just, a, I wonder if I write with the craze that would write back. It was as simple as that. And um, they did. Reg wrote back first. Ron wrote back a couple of days later. Both of them say more or less the same thing, that, you know, they couldn't keep up with correspondence, but thanks, thanks for the support and well done on passing your exams. Simple yeah. as that. And I left it at that. I didn't, I didn't intend to push on or, or continue with that, you know, with that, you know, interest. But um, as things turned out, things took a turn and, and things did change because it was about six months later that um, my mom came into the house she had a, a magazine called Take a Break. And inside the magazine was a double page spread uh, of this young guy called Brad Lane, who basically the headline screamed, um, I am Reggie Cray's adopted son. And I was like, wow, you know, I didn't even know he had a son, you know. And yeah. as, you, as you read the article, it was a young guy from Doncaster who was only 11 years of age. And his mom had taken him to see Reggie Cray. And, you know, they were now looking at getting legal adoption forms sorted out because, you know, Reg got on very well with them. That was like a father and son relationship. So yeah. I wrote to them. I wrote to them. It was easy to easy to do. You know, the kid was called Brad Lane. It was in Dunscroft in Doncaster. There was enough of the 
enough of that information in the article. And I wrote to them and that's how the relationship started uh, between me and the craze because they wrote back, um, they invited me down uh, to Doncaster to, to go and see them and to go and look at some of the stuff that they owned. And, you know, I went down to visit them a, a couple of months later and the stuff that they had were things like Francis Cray's engagement ring, uh, Reggie Cray's suits from the 1960s, uh, the David Bailey photographs from, from the Francis and Reggie Cray wow. wedding. Um, it was like a treasure treasure trove of Crow, uh, Cray memorabilia in this bedroom. And I was, I was fascinated. And whilst I was there that day, there was a, a phone call and Brad ran to the phone all excited. And um, he goes, Dad, Dad. And it was Reggie Cray on the phone. And he spoke to him and then he gave the phone to, to his mom and she just said, Steve, would you like to speak to Reggie Cray? And that was it. I spoke to Reggie Cray. So it was, it was, it, it was so surreal because I'd read the book. I passed my exam. I'd written to Reg. I'd written to Ron and thought it was all over. Now I'm speaking to the guy on the end of the phone who essentially is inviting me to go and have a visit with him in Gartry prison. And Fantastic. that's where, that's where the journey began. And that's, that's how the true crime interest came about. And of course, it, it dovetailed and spiraled from there. And you had a long relationship with the Craze, didn't you? Going to see them. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I mean, it was to... it was 10, it was 10 years. Um, you know, from from the initial meeting with Reggie Cray. Um, it was it was a 10-year relationship with with the Cray twins. It was a, a shorter relationship with Ronnie Cray because Ronnie was in Broadmoor and of course passed away in 95. But with Reggie Cray, yeah, it was um it was it was, it was a lot of ups and downs, you know, we, you know, we, the initial visits were great. There was a friendship built up. Um, I never, I never thought anything unusual about it, although other people did. My mom was very supportive. My dad was completely against it. Um, but, you know, bearing in mind, I was 18, 19 by this stage and, you know, you know, essentially working with the craze because <laughs> when I'd left school and, I'd, and the, you know, the, 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 the theatre course had come to an end and it, I ended up going and working in the family business, which was a, which was a post office. And whilst I was working at the post office, I had a lot of spare time, obviously, you know, when, when the, when the, the place wasn't busy. So I, I, I've used my skills um, and, and got together with one of my mates to design t-shirts. So I went to the craze um, and, and suggested that we do t-shirts with their image on. Um, they liked the idea. And, and, you know, we shook hands uh, on a 70-30 deal uh, to them, 70% for them, 30% for me. And I had to put the, the money in to try and generate the, you know, generate the T-shirts. And, and it was a gamble for me. But, they, but I went into business with the craze. And it sounds as if it's a lopsided deal, but it was 35% for Ron, 35% for Reg, and 30% for me. And um, those T-shirts sold like proverbial hotcakes. We did very, we did very well on them. Uh, me, for a young man, did, did exceptionally well well with with the money and you know me and my business partner had, had hit upon something massive there and and and, and it went on for a, a good couple of uh, a good couple of months and and you know essentially we were supplying shops in Newcastle which which was great you know then Sunderland then Middlesbrough then Darlington then York yeah, expanded. And, and, and it started to expand and this is all before the internet had really kicked in you know this was this was all, you know, phone calls and letters back in the good old days. And, 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 you know, we got as far as London, believe it or not, when we hit a, we hit a stumbling block and we thought London would really be a great place for us because that's where the craze are from. If we can do well with create t-shirts in the North, then surely we can, we can double that in, in London. Um, but we had a stumbling block because somebody else was doing t-shirts in London. And um, basically it, it led to me having you know, to, to do some investigation work on behalf of the craze as to who would dare do these T-shirts without their permission. Um, all roads led to a, an antique shop in Croydon um, where I had to ring this guy on a Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock to find out, you know, who this guy was who was making these T-shirts and, you know, whether we could come to some kind of compromise. And when I ran, I rang this number uh, that I'd been given by somebody uh, on the Wednesday at three o'clock, um, th this gravelly voice comes on and I uh, said, hi, it's Steve Wraith. I said, uh, I've been asked by Ronnie and Reggie Cray to, to you know, to ask why you're selling T-shirts down in London because you yeah. know, they want to sell their T-shirts down there. 
And he goes, well, I have got a right. He says, my name's Charlie Cray. It was the rule of brother. <laughs> um, it was the rule of brother, of course, who was, who was doing the business behind their back. And um, that led to them not speaking to Charlie for about a year. Um, I've got numerous wow. letters after that occasion where they refer to Charlie as Mr. X, um, <laughs> which, which is quite funny. And this, as I got to know the twins more and, and got to know Charlie more, um, you know, it turned out that this was quite a regular event. Uh, at the time, I was quite gobsmacked and a bit, you know, nervy that it would be me who would cause this split between the brothers. But Ronnie and Reggie were pleased that I'd solved the mystery and were very annoyed at Charlie for making money behind their back. But this was all par for the course. And the way I describe it is, you, you know, you ask how it goes into the podcast about true crime. It's because over that 10 year period, Charlie Cray, in particular, opened a lot of doors for me. He introduced me to a lot of the faces who yeah. I'd read about. And of course, after professional violence, it, it opened the door for other books to come out. So Tony Lambriano brought a book out called Inside the Firm. John Dixon brought a book out called Murder Without Conviction. Albert Donahue brought a book out and so on and so forth. So the Cray firm started to bring books out. And then the Crays started to bring out other books which contradicted the original book that came out. You know, Ron and Reg wrote a book called uh, Our Story, which was with Fred Dinage. And then Ron brought a book out called My Story. Reg brought a book out called Born Fighter. All of these books contradicting each other, but all making money for them. Yeah. Um, but I met all of these characters. I met the Freddie Foremans. I met the Albert Donahues. I met the Tony Lambrianis. I met all of these people who were close to the twins. And, and, and a lot of that was down to Charlie because, you know, he would, he would invite me to social nights out in London and he just opened the doors. So my interest in true crime really came, you know, from the craze and, and that led on to me, you know, years later during lockdown to, to actually doing podcasts about true crime. Oh, that's fantastic. What an experience. So, uh, Philip, you wanted to ask Steve about his boxing. Yeah, m moving on to another area of uh, great interest to you is uh, is boxing. Because am I right in thinking you were involved in some promotion business at one time? Yeah, I mean, following in the footsteps of the twins again, because the twins were seven, you know, both seven and uh, you know seven professional fights they both had. Uh, Ronnie Ronnie lost a couple, but Reggie was seven and zero. Oh. Uh, you know, Reg could have been a professional boxer. There's no doubt about it. He could have gone to make a, a really good career of it. Um, but I was always interested in boxing. Football was my great love, but boxing was always a, a close second. And I never boxed myself, um, but I would always train. I, I would train down at the local gym in Gateshead, where I was brought up. And um, it was a pure chance meeting with a, a family uh, up in Newcastle called the Sayers family. They're a well-renowned well crime family, although all retired now. And um, they approached me and said, we'd like you to meet our cousin, who's a traveling man, who would like to bring up some unlicensed boxing to the Northeast. And I uh, said, well, I know nothing about putting on a boxing show. They said, don't worry, he, he'll, he'll guide you. At least have a meeting with him. So that's what I did. So I met Philip Riley uh, in Newcastle. And he explained that, um, you know, they had their own uh, official unlicensed boxing organization, uh, it was all licensed. It was covered by insurance and they were looking to launch it in Newcastle and they thought I would be the right person to do it because at that time I'd started to put events on, talking events, etc. cetera. Um, so I said, well, look, I'll give it a go. Tell us what, tell us what I have to do and I'll give it a go. And nine years later, I'd, I'd put on 38 shows. Um, wow. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was great. It was, it was a unique opportunity to be involved at something at the start. And there was an, although it was unlicensed, there was an air of professionalism about it. And it was called white collar boxing. So, you know, we, you, we, you know, basically all I had to do was advertise for fighters in the Northeast, which I had, you know, a lot of people who wanted to do it. Uh, they provided the opposition. Uh, they provided the ring and the, uh, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the, the MC. Um, and they, they sorted out the insurance sector. So it was, it was easy to do. Once I'd done the first one, it was easy to do. And the first one was memorable because it was, it was in my own backyard at the time. It was in a place called Felling and Gates at a social club, which is not there now. And I managed to persuade a former professional boxer from these parts, John Davison, to have a farewell fight. Well, of course, that was big news up here because John Davison is, is probably as well known up here as maybe Glenn McCrory is, who's, who's got better national recognition. But John Davison came and had his final fight on the show. But we, we had a venue which held 400 people and we crammed 500 in. So it tells you that it was a very popular <laughs> night 
uh, a very popular show and um we 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 discovered some really talented youngsters who were you know ready to make their name on the unlicensed circuit so i had some great shows we Sometimes we mixed it with um, doing a talking, and we had we'd have some fighting as as the the other entertainment. So I put Larry Holmes on, um, and I had uh, an undercard of fights, which Larry really enjoyed. Um, but sometimes we had boxers who would who would step into the ring who were ex professionals. We had um, Michael Gomez from Manchester got in and fought on one of our shows in Whitley Bay. We had. Uh, Riddick Bo, who of course um, had boxed in, you know, Mike Tyson and, and fought some of the greats. Um, he, he came along and, and got into the ring. Uh, Tony Tucker boxed on one of our shows as well. Another well-known heavyweight who boxed Tyson. So, you know, we had some great names and some great links and um, some great, great nights. But uh, all good things come to an end. Um, there started to be a lot of copycats uh, happening up here in the Northeast. I found that yeah. people who came to my show and then want to, then they would pull out without telling me and they've already gone on to somebody else's show. And I also had a feeling that, you know, that I should give the pro game a go. Glenn McCrory had been, you know, having a, you know, having a few words with me saying that the pro game is suffering in the Northeast because people like you were doing the unlicensed. And, you know, I, I was a boxing fan. So I thought, look, I'll give the pro game a go. And, and, and that's what I did. And uh, again, nine years of that. So 18 years in total of being involved in boxing, but I did nine years in the pro game. And, you know, alongside some really good promoters, the likes of Phil Jeffries, who's been doing it for many years, Tommy Conroy um, as well, another guy from Sunderland. Um, you know, I, I helped put the Northeast boxing back on the map. We, we managed to bring, you know, Eddie Hearn back to the Northeast. It took me, it took me numerous phone calls and, and one meeting in London to persuade him to at least give us a chance. He came up, and, and once he came up, he never looked back. And um, it put Northeast Boxing on the map. We we went from having something like 33 professionals signed up in the Northeast full stop to over 150. All one That's the fantastic pro. achievement, isn't it? And it pulled kids away from the streets and, you know, gave them, a, you know, they could see... Gave them something end. to look to. Yeah, they could see there was an end goal. They could see if they turned professional, they weren't wasting their time. If they stuck in and did well... They could, you know, they could end up on one of these undercards for a matchroom show and put themselves in the shop window. And I had a couple of really great nights. I think I did the undercard for Anthony Joshua's first fight in the Northeast, which was fantastic. Um, and I managed to get an opportunity for a young guy called Anthony Nelson to box for the Commonwealth title on there, and he won it. It was a shock win on uh, the Anthony Joshua undercard. In a game with Anthony Nelson, we uh, we managed to put him on in his hometown. And we sold out the venue uh, when he when he came to fight for his English title, which he won, uh, 1,500, capa 1500 capacity sellout at that show. So had some great nights, some great opportunities. I you know and and just I loved it, but it, it wasn't a money money making thing because it's so hard to make money out of the uh, the professional game. Unlicensed, yeah, you can make money. The professional game is very very difficult. Yeah, and that's not your only sporting interest, is it, Steve? Because you let the the Newcastle fan, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, football is football is a way of life up here. It's it, it is very much like a religion. Um, and of course, I've been a Newcastle fan since 1983-84 season when Kevin Keegan was a, a footballer and he was playing for Newcastle. And we got promoted with Keegan, Waddle, and Beardsley in the team. And fantastic days, fantastic memories. Uh, we um Played a memorable game that season. The very last game of the season would be Brighton 3 1. And uh, I just remember Peter Beersley scoring this sublime goal over the top of Joe Corrigan. And, um, you know, that just capped a wonderful season in Newcastle, got promoted. And in the testimonial game at the end of the season, Keegan flew off on a helicopter. And what more could you want from a football club? It was like, this is, this is my team. And uh, since then, there's been a lot of highs and lows. And I've got involved in. You know, a lot of the fans, you know, the fans organizations and fan groups that, you know, I, I wrote and produced uh, fanzines back in the day when they were when they were, you know, all the rage. Um, I did a, a magazine called The Mighty Quinn, which was named after Mickey Quinn. It was our number nine. Uh, then I went into making the number nine football magazine when Mickey Quinn left. Um, I ventured into doing one about all the teams. We did a, a magazine called Players Inc., which which ran for 36, uh, 36 issues and covered the fortunes of Newcastle, Sunderland, Middlesbrough, Darlington, Hartlepool and Gateshead. And um, we had a lot of ex-professionals working on that magazine as well. So, you know, football has been a way of life for me. And um, of course, it's given me a little bit of notoriety in these parts. 
and further abroad. I mean, you know, whenever there's been big stories breaking on Newcastle United, I've often been seen not just on the local television or heard on the local radio, but I've done a lot for Sky Sports. I've done a lot for uh, Sky News, uh, BBC, ITV, you name it, all the networks. I've, I've worked on a lot of those, um, you know, channels over the years, you know, talking about the, the fortunes or the misfortunes of the football club. And since lockdown, of course, you know, managed to, to set up a podcast. And I think people who go onto my Steve Wraith YouTube channel will see that there's, you know, predominantly Newcastle content. I do true crime once a week. Uh, I do a current affairs show once a week, but uh, it's predominantly Newcastle United. And um, yeah, it's, it's something that I enjoy. I travel home and away and uh yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, I think, you know, it's black and white, black and white for me, uh, first and foremost, <laughs> definitely. Because oh, how busy you are, do you get to watch most of the matches? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm a family man. I've got two daughters and, um, you know, they're now getting older. Um, I did put my travelling uh, to away games on hold because I wanted to spend time with the girls, you know, be available to date them out, do stuff with them. Um, but now with them getting older, they want to do their own thing on a weekend and they've got their own independence and they're off doing their own thing. So this season is the first season I've been back on the road with Newcastle and I've thoroughly enjoyed it, even though the football's been atrocious at times and Newcastle's fortunes haven't been what we were hoping for. Um, you know, it, it's still been good to get away and visit the grounds and, and pop in and see friends who I haven't seen for a long time. You know, I mean, it's you know, it, it, it's it's part and part of the travelling for me is, is being able to catch up with Newcastle fans who live in Leicester or live in Manchester or live in Liverpool or live in London um, or catching up with people who support those teams and, and being able to catch up with them and, and spend some time with them. That's that's what I like to do. I'm not, not somebody who goes on the, on the road and has a drink. I like to just, you know, I'd rather go and catch up with somebody at the local pub and, you know, have a meal or go and, you know, catch up with them in a... You know, in, in, you know, have a coffee with them. That's that's what I tend to do because yes. I like to watch the game. I like to watch the match. I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not a kid anymore. Um, and and you know, going and having ten pints of lager and you know, <laughs> getting into mischief isn't for me anymore. Um, you have a wide social media and YouTube following, and which podcasts proved to be the most popular ones with your listeners and watchers? It's strange because obviously it's predominantly black and white. It's Newcastle United. And I mean, they, they just bring me a really good average in, um, you know, the average, you know, the average viewing figures for my channel a month um, in, in the, well, it's 5.5.4 million views we usually get per month. Uh, that's where we're at. I've got 46 and a half thousand subscribers. Um, it's a revenue. It's an income, which I never, which I never set out to, to achieve. Um, but the fact that we built it over lockdown and people love it and begged me not to stop the Newcastle stuff meant you know, it just means we've continued to do it. Um, the biggest ones have been the most controversial ones. Um, I interviewed David Icke, and, 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 and of course, people were expecting David to come on and talk about um, you know, the Queen being an alien um, and, and, and various, other, uh, various other things about aliens taking over the earth, um, his views, his rather controversial views on, on you know, the pandemic. Uh, but I didn't interview him about that. I interviewed him about his career, and he and he was yeah. thoroughly he was thoroughly um, delighted that somebody had actually remembered that he used to be a sports commentator, that he used to be a goalkeeper, um, and that he actually had a, a life before all of this, you know, controversial stuff that he does now. Um, so we had a we had a full hour interview, but it was about fifty five minutes before he got into trying to get a little bit in about what he wanted to say and oh. we just enjoyed it and I, I, like every good podcaster you do your research you, you know you find out a little bit a little bit about them to try and catch them out and i knew two things one that he was the substitute goalkeeper uh when newcastle united were beaten by hereford in the fa cup the, the well you know the well played goal of ronnie radford scoring and all those people with parkers running onto the pitch <laughs> I knew that he was the reserve keeper. Well, he was actually at the game, but he was sitting in the stand uh, because in those days it was one substitute, so he wasn't on the bench. And I also knew that he commentated on Kevin Keegan's debut for Newcastle United in 1982. So those were two great, you know, two great little things. When you do your research, you can see that you can see that the interviewees happy as well that they've, you know, they've, they've bothered to look into something um, and not just catch them catch them unaware. But you know, it was it was lovely. So. That one was really popular. Um, I guess the, the other one was the controversial one was with Tommy Robinson. Um, now, Tommy Robinson, of course, has, you know, extreme political views, some would say. Um, and, you know, I, I got him on my channel in February last year because 
he's been shut down on all on all YouTube channels and, and everything else. But I got him on not because of his him being closed down. I got him on because um, basically I was being the victim of a lot of trolling online because of um, because of the Saudi takeover, of which I was a big supporter of. And there was a, a journalist who will remain nameless. Um, but this particular journalist had written and filed a story um, which was untrue about me, claiming that I had far right connections with Tommy Robinson. Now, this story stemmed from um, a photograph which had been taken five years ago, uh, where I'm on a photo with Tommy Robinson in a, in a bar not far from where I live, where he'd come to watch the actual match. And this is where the, this is where the story basically generated from. Um, I said, I don't mind being in the photograph as long as it doesn't go on social media because a couple of my mates had wanted to get me and him in this photograph. Yeah. You can see the photograph when it's in its entirety. I look rather uncomfortable in this photograph. However, it didn't go onto social media until about six months later. Unbeknown to me, then, someone screen grabs it. So for the last two or three years, that had been used against me on a regular basis on social media mm. to say, oh, there's Steve Wraith with his pal, there's Steve Wraith with his mate. Now, I, you know, listen, I shrug it off. I, I've often gone, well, that's fine. You know, what can I do about it? It's in the public domain, Yvonne. Um, you know, and, and he who protests, you know, uh, you know, protests too much kind of thing. Yeah. He's got something to hide. And I just thought, well, nothing I can do. It's out there. You know, anybody who knows me knows that I'm not that way inclined and, and who I vote for. Um, but there was an opportunity coming with the Saudi takeover um, where, in a nutshell, I was being considered for a position, position shall we say, at the club. And this particular position um, clearly had got, uh, the journalist had got wind of that. So they decided to write and file this story uh, to suggest that um, this job that I was going to be offered at the club, um, you know, wouldn't be well suited for somebody with far right connections, shall we say. So my idea was get him on the show um, and clear me name, which is what I did. So I opened my opening gambit with Tommy Robinson on the interview was, are we friends? Do we know each other? Um, and I made it quite clear that my politics isn't his politics. So it did a job, but it was, it was quite a, it was quite a storm, shall we say on social media because the fan base went mad um, saying that I was tying him in with Newcastle United. I wasn't at all. I never mentioned Newcastle United in the interview, um, but it was because I'm a well-known Newcastle fan. I actually put a, before the interview, I actually put out a call for questions um, and I asked him every far left question you could possibly imagine. So yeah. I would say the interview was probably the best interview that's ever been done with Tommy Robinson. Didn't shirk the questions. You won't like the answers he gave if you're far left or in the middle. Um, but I thought he, I thought it was a good interview. And it's something I'm really proud of. It got great figures. But then, as you would predict, YouTube took it down. So... Those two interviews are probably the, the, the ones that I had the, the, the most interest in. There's a lot of controversy, though. YouTube loves controversy. Yeah, and some does. of these gangland figures um, that I've interviewed or, or go backwards and forwards with have had lots of issues, lots of problems. Some of them have problems with each other. And I find a lot of those gain traction as well. I can put an interview up with one, one particular guy, Stephen Sayers, who I mentioned earlier, and it'll get 30,000 views. No problem. Mm. Um, but I could put one up with somebody who I've just interviewed, you know, who's got a, a, a fantastic story about doing this and doing that and doing the other, and it'll get a thousand. Um, it, yeah, it makes it, no it, sense it, sometimes. It, well, it doesn't. No, it doesn't, because you think if they're like you, they're going to like that. But it's, I build it up. It's something I'm proud of. And I didn't expect before lockdown to see it. should be. have got some amazing, amazing numbers on there, haven't you? Yeah. Which is, your, is one of those your favourite episodes, then? I've got to be honest, I've enjoyed a few. I loved interviewing um, Tom Stoltman, the world's strongest man, which I did recently. Um, that was that was fantastic to, to actually just I, I watch that every year at Christmas time. So that was great. That was a, that was a personal favorite. Um, I do enjoy I do enjoy, you know, the the conversations with people whose stories are quite new to me because I get in, I get I get emailed quite a bit about different things. Um, you know, the, I've just done one with a guy called Rich Jones, who I didn't know, never heard of him. And he's written a book called uh, Charlie Four Kilo. And he was in the army. And he, when he left the army, he didn't get any help. He was clearly suffering um, mental issues. And, you know, he, he basically went into the, into the, the drug industry 
and he ended up being the biggest supplier of drugs in Bristol. And that story is a fascinating story. Somebody going from a, mil a military career uh, in, uh, into being the biggest drugs kingpin in, in, in that part of the world is fascinating. He's recovered. He, he went to jail, of course. Lee Davies, another great one where that guy was a professional footballer. He played for Preston North End. Um, didn't quite make it. Dropped out of that. So then he becomes a fireman. Um, you know, another great job, another job for life. Becomes yeah. a fireman. Uh, but then sadly, um, you know, doesn't get posted where he wants to. So he walks away from that. He then becomes a prison officer. Another, you know, another job with, with a uniform, another job with a good, with good pay. Um, but that's where his life really, really started to struggle. And um, he ended up basically becoming um, a rogue police, uh, a rogue prison officer. And he started transporting stuff into the prison for the criminals. And oh, he, got caught. he got caught and he ended up in prison. And again, there's another fantastic story. So I love doing those where there's a there's a roller coaster. Um, Paul Paul Bogie, another one who became who was this is the flip side of it. He was a heroin addict. Um, he was at the lowest step. He was homeless. Um, but then he turned himself around. He got himself off heroin, and he ended up joining the Royal Scots Guards. Um, so you know, there's loads of different ways. And of course, interviewing you two uh, about Jeremy's case. I mean miscarriages of justice are very important uh, to me. I mean, I've seen it happen with the Sears brothers. There's numerous cases in the Northeast where there's been miscarriages of justice. I'm a, a big reader of the Essex boys case and don't believe that the right people were arrested and convicted for that. And, you know, getting you guys on to come on and just use my platform to, you know, get the message out there was, was quite important to me as well. So I do enjoy doing, you know, I do enjoy doing those. And as, as for the football you know, the football ones, I, I, enjoy, <laughs> I, en, I enjoy doing them all. I, I couldn't really pick a, a one out. I think sitting back and listening to John Gibson and, and Malcolm McDonald, which is a reporter and a former player on a Thursday night, who are both, you know, both in the seventies, waxing lyrical about the, the good old days. You know, they talk about modern day football, but they can, they can at the drop of a hat, start bringing a story in about the 1970s, which I wasn't akin to. It's fascinating. So I, I just count myself lucky. It's, you know, to be able to be able to do something like that as a hobby where you can still generate a, a, an income from it is fantastic. It's amazing, isn't it? But one thing I wanted to ask you is about a podcast you've done recently. So Jeremy's not allowed to take part in any interviews with journalists and filmmakers, etc., over the phone. But you've recently featured a podcast with Charles Salvador, who some most people all know better as Charlie Bronson. And Charlie's in solitary confinement and is monitored very closely. And so, please, can you let the listeners know how you on earth you managed to get an interview with him? Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's something which we talked about on many occasions. I, I visit Charlie; he's in Woodhill Prison at this moment in time. Um, and and I think you will understand where I'm coming from here when you say that you know the press and the media um, thrive on you know big name characters. They did they did it with Ronnie and Reggie Cray. Um, they certainly do it with Jeremy and, and they do it with Charlie. And yes. it's because they get column inches. They've, they've done it with more uh, heinous criminals like, you know, Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, uh, for instance, or Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. Uh, column inches on those people um, sells newspapers and gets hits online. So Charlie is a victim of, of that. Um, you know, Charlie hasn't killed anybody. Charlie is never, you know, he's, he's not that kind of, uh, mentality, you know, he's. he's if we can you know, just tell people who don't know Steve, Charlie's crime was he robbed a post office. He, he, yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, he he didn't get away with didn't get away with a three figure sum. Um, it was the worst robbery in living history, and uh, <laughs> and ultimately, and ultimately, from his perspective, I mean, you can laugh about that now, but you know, he wasn't a very good criminal, and he he's serving such a long sentence. I mean, he's he's coming into you know the best part of. Uh, so 23 years in solitary confinement, literally behind a door, 23 years, no exercise outside that cell, being fed through a cage. And, uh, you know, you're coming up the best part of 50 years. You, you, you know, we're rapidly approaching 50 years of his life inside prison. Um, he had 80 days freedom in the 90s, uh, but he was back inside again after that. So with that little break, um, it's, it's still, you know, you're still talking probably another 27, 28 years now. He's been you know, in, in the highest level of prisons. But the interview situation really came about because the, the parole, which he was trying to get, was, was seeming to be put back. You know, the parole here and he was, you know, he wasn't confident he was going to get, you know, get, get out. And I said, well, why don't we 
why don't we try and paint a picture of you, you know, as you are, you know, let, let people hear exactly what you like. And he goes, well, how are we going to do that? And I said, well, I says, every now and then you leave a message on the answering machine. I says, why don't we start doing that? You know, I said, then, you know, we, you know, we'll give it a go. I says, what's the worst that can happen? I says, you've got a, he's got a phone in his cell. Um, what's the worst that can happen? You, you could lose your phone privileges. And he went, well, I can live with that. I said, okay, well, let's do it. So for a year, that's what we did. Um, he would leave messages. He would, I wouldn't always be in because, you, you know, you can't arrange, you know, you're not going to arrange when he's going to ring, you know, unless there's something yeah. desperate he wants to talk about. But he would just say, well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll ring you back. And, you know, I knew then he wanted us to record it. So we would record something and I'd say, what about the craze? What about, you know, this? What about that? And he would talk and give a story and, you know, because he's only tied to 15 minutes um, and then before the call drops off, if he felt that there was a story needed to be finished, he would ring back and we'll maybe do half an hour. So it was as simple as that, really. We, we literally just, you know, I recorded phone calls uh, and some of them were answering machine messages. But when I put them up, um, the reaction was phenomenal because it, basically, because it just changed the whole dimension for Charlie. Charlie's mailbag was full of people going, wow, you should be let out. Um, mm. This is incredible. You know, like, I can't believe you've been in for that long. And and it gives him the opportunity to get the messages out that he wants to get out. And, you know, after, you know, he did get a phone ban. He was banned for four weeks, um, full stop. Um, he wasn't banned from ringing me per se, which was, which was surprising. I've got to be honest. Um, but the fact that we managed to do it, we managed to put up, I think in the region of 36 recordings um, was, was fantastic. And well, I, you know, I, I, I picked, I picked some of the best ones and, and some of the worst ones because I wanted to show, you know, I didn't just want to sugarcoat it. Sometimes Charlie does get upset about things and, you know, a, a, a bit annoyed. So it covered everything, but I just think people love the fact that he likes to have a laugh. He's talking about football. He's talking about, he's a big Spurs fan. He's, you know, he's, it just humanized him. Instead I of think as well, because the people have heard Charlie actually speaking himself and saying these things for himself, that people's misconceptions of his character have been, you know, corrected now and people realise who the real Charlie is. And it's the same with Jeremy. I mean, if we were just given that opportunity to be able to let him have a proper interview so people can hear his voice and hear who he really is and hear him tell his story, it makes would make a massive difference. Oh, it does. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I just think it's, you know, it's only it's only fair that two sides of the story are heard in, in anything in life. And um, you know, as far as as far as Charlie's concerned, you know, we managed to give him that opportunity and they've made life difficult for him, you know, they don't make it easy. I mean, Charlie used to be able to send artwork out to anybody, so they stopped him from doing that. And now you can only get artwork from Charlie if you send in a letter and you have a registered charity number attached to that letter. Um, you know, they, a couple of years ago, the the prison would only do halal meat for, uh, for for you know for Christmas dinner. Well, Charlie doesn't eat halal meat. He wants you know he wanted a proper proper turkey. Um, you know that was a potential you know flashpoint which he you know he he managed to maneuver his way through without causing any issues. Um, he just had no meat on his dinner that Christmas. Um, you know, the, 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 he had problems with with obtaining this watch, which was sent in, which he shouldn't have had any issues with, but he didn't bite at that. So I think what Charlie's done over the last couple of years is um, he's just towed the line. And, you know, he, I, you know, you can hear it on the recording. Sometimes he's you can see that he's really annoyed about stuff, but he vents his spleen by speaking to people rather than taking it out on prison officers. And I think he realises now, you know, that violence and and causing disruption within the prison system isn't going to get him anywhere. So he had a huge, he had a huge victory last year when, you know, when he was awarded a public parole hearing, which is fantastic, you know, and he's got a good solicitor on board. He's got a public parole hearing, which takes place in September, which is the only downside. It's been put back and put back. At first yeah. it was COVID. And um, now it's, they can't decide whether Charlie goes on the out to court and people can go in the public gallery or whether they come inside prison. I think it's now, Charlie is pushing for it to be in court and he goes out and people are going to be in the public gallery. So that's the way it's going to be, I believe. Yeah, so, and that's in September. It is, yeah, that's in September. And, um, you know, he's got a good team around him. There's me, there's Richard Booth, um, there's Gemma, Gemma Fernandez, who runs his website. You know, there's three of us who, you know, are, are essentially working, you know, working for him and working with his best intentions. And we're, we're going to launch a Charlie podcast. We're going to do a podcast once a week. 
um, if, if, if there's enough material once a week, just to, just to get stuff out there, you know, really just to keep people updated because, you know, there is a big interest in them. There is a big following. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to be pushing with a petition to release Charlie uh, in 2022 as well. So that, that you know, there's, there's a lot to consider, uh, but there's a lot, a lot of stuff going to be happening with regards to Charlie over the next, uh, over the next few months. Excellent. It all sounds very positive. What, what other, have you got any other big name guests lined up for, for the near future? Talking to quite a few people. I mean, I've got to be honest. I tend to I, I tend to wait until somebody comes to me or somebody comes to me and says, "Look, why don't you speak to to that person or why don't you speak to to this person?" I mean, there's there's one or two names who I'd love to interview. Um, but you know, the I I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'd love to I'd love to get Kenny Knight to break his silence. Um, I know Kenny and I've met him. Um, but it's not something for him at this moment in time. I'd like to get John Sears on, but again. He's very, very like Kenny in the sense that, you know, never broken cover, never come out and said anything and uh, very reluctant to do so. Um, I did the I did the Freddie Foreman documentary, uh, which with Salon Pictures, you know, I was a producer on that, um, which was just simply called Fred. Um, you know, it got a good show on Netflix and um, it's still available on DVD to buy. But it was that was great. I'd love to have got Fred on a podcast, but there's no chance of that now. He's 90 next month. Um, and he, you know, he's just he said when we did that documentary that would be the last thing that he would ever do, um, with regards to the media and TV. And it was a great way to go. It's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful documentary of his life, uh, something I'm immensely proud of for being involved in. Um, but yeah, if you if, if, I, if I had a dream one, um, I'd love to interview Tyson. I've, I've put Tyson on in Newcastle, Mike Tyson. Um, I've put him on in Newcastle a couple of times. I'd love to do a podcast with him, um, you know, down the line or, or face to face. And it, and if we're going to go into acting, I'd I'd love to do either Al Pacino or Robert De Niro because they're two of my favourite actors. I'd love to I'd love to be able to sit down and do something with them um, at some point. But um, I think I would... when when Jeremy's conviction is crushed, you'll be able to talk to Jeremy. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, it would be nice to it would be nice to do one with Jeremy. You know, I mean, there's you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff which I've seen obviously by yourself in in a short period of time, and then obviously getting news on the channel, which which I didn't know about either. You know, I found it fascinating. I mean, if people watch back the podcast with you guys on on my channel, it's um, you know, you can see that I'm I'm not lost for words very often. I just I'm sitting quite <laughs> even. You've given me a bit of an intro as to what what you were going to say, but you know, it was, it was fascinating. And I think the key with podcasts and good podcasts is is just letting the person speak it as long as they're confident because sometimes you will get people who will come on who aren't very confident to uh, talking or not used to public speaking or you know struggle with technology and you know you you know you, you don't get the best out of them so you you know you, you sometimes have to you know to give them a nudge and get them through but but other people are just natural to come on they can talk and um yeah it was just it was a pleasure to sit and listen so yes when you know when jeremy gets out it'll be good to interview him and could I just ask you to, to wrap up what um what evidence is it that makes you support and believe in Jeremy's innocence? I just think, you know, I, I've got to be honest, my own personal views about police per se is that there are good and bad in everybody, and that includes the police. Um, it's certainly, you know, a lot of evidence has been tampered with. Um, I think the scene of crime really, really is the thing that I looked at, you know, uh, stuff that you brought to me about scene of crime and um, stuff being moved, um, you, know, the, the, you know, the timings are all out with phone calls. Um, I, there's so much. I, I, I put it akin to Neil Jackson's case um, up here, the one-armed bandit murder. It's, yeah. so, it's so like that. Um, you know, you guys can lay the case out to me and say, you know, this, 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 and this. And that's what Neil Jackson did with that Angus Sibber case. It's it's so obvious to anybody who takes time to sit and look at it that Jeremy couldn't have done this. Never mind. Um, never mind there's there's a doubt or there is um, you know, there's a doubt that he could have done this or done that. And I I just think the the damning stuff is is some of the family as well. And it's what the family stood in the game. I think, you know, that you have to look at it with when you look at it with a complete impartiality and somebody who's not on the you know, the inside looking out, but you're on the outside looking in. I think it's yeah. fairly obvious to everybody. And I think that's why, you know, Jeremy and yourselves have got so much support. But, you know, there's so many things which are wrong with this case, which makes it an unsafe conviction. Um, but, you know, it, it's the problem is it's such a high profile case. 
but you just wonder is it going to happen and you know it, 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 are you going to get that that chance to to overturn it but you know you've got to keep on going because when you hit those brick walls or when you get the knockback you've just got to carry on and you can see that Jeremy does that you know you can see that Jeremy does that and he's you know he, he will he will it rely just makes, it just makes us more determined because we know what we've got is absolutely amazing evidence that should overturn Jeremy's conviction and every knockback just drives us harder anyway. Of course it does. Of course it does. And that's the key. And it's, you, you rely heavily, I guess, when you're the person locked up on that support network on the outside. But, you know, it amazed me when, when I first heard of you, Yvonne, and, and, and you know, I'd, I'd heard how many documents you'd been through, um, you know, you and Philip combined, <laughs> you know, and, and how more, how many more documents they are to go through, but this is what they do. They just create mountain and mountains of paperwork and they just hope that you can't find that proverbial needle, needle in the haystack. And that, that is the problem, you know. And it's, um, it's, it's only when you get somebody coming along, you know, which can prove with on, beyond all reasonable doubt that this happened, that's when you get things moving. I mean, fascinating one in current affairs at the moment, um, you know, the Michael Stone case. Yeah. I mean, now, I've got to be honest. I have grave doubts on that confession by Levi Belfield, by the way. Uh, but... You know, those people who are or have campaigned, I guess, you know, the legal team to get Stone out. Yeah. That's, that's gold dust for them. So, you know, unless someone comes along like that, but Jeremy, you are going to have to continue working as hard as you can to get to that, get to that end goal. But I think, I think you will. Time moves on. Uh, science moves on. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully you will reach the end game that you all, all want and all deserve. Oh, well, we're very confident, aren't we, Philip? So, we are, definitely, yes. Yeah. So, definitely. Uh, and we'd like to just thank you again for giving us the opportunity to come on your show and hopefully when we hear back from the Criminal Cases Review Commission imminently, well, hopefully with a referral, we'll be able to come on and, and talk to you about that and about the grounds of appeal in more detail then because uh, a lot of them aren't public yet and I think there's going to be a lot of shocks great stuff look forward to it uh, I'll be eagerly watching that as well but uh, no fantastic thanks for having us on as well it was a pleasure to have you guys thanks so much for your time today it's been absolutely fascinating yeah Always. thanks a lot Steve thanks very much thank you speak to you soon bye